It's been very good today, as uh, everybody will testify. And um, clear all, all, all the uh, subjects which are dealing with capital, volume one, certainly point in the direction that capitalism itself is an unstable system. It's a system which is um, prone to crisis. And uh, in the subsequent volumes that, uh, Capital, uh, that uh, Marx wrote, he goes into these questions in uh, a lot more detail. Clearly, uh, crisis has been around a long time. Crisis existed before capitalism existed. Um, in the Middle Ages, people perished because the harvests failed, or there was a natural disaster. Or there was a plague. Generally, generally you could say that the crisis uh, at that time was a crisis of underproduction. That society could not produce enough food to sustain the population. The crisis under capitalism, however, is fundamentally different from that. Here we have crises which are born out of overproduction, crises of overproduction, unheard of in the history of humanity, and shows the contradictions that capitalism has ended us in. That the market uh, cannot absorb the amount of production that capitalism produces, on a, on a profitable basis that is. And therefore periodically, it ends uh, not just in a, in a boom, but an almighty slump. A cyclical development of boom and slump, which has always been inherent in the capitalist system since the beginning of capitalism. And that uh, arises from this, uh, this contradiction that the working class uh, only receives in wages only a part of the value that it produces. And it cannot buy back with the wages it has, the products that it produces. Uh, and therefore, there's a, a crisis of overproduction. The workers cannot buy back the fruits of its labor. However, if that is the case, why isn't capitalism collapsed on day one? Well, the reason is that capitalism is able to overcome this contradiction. It is able to develop its own market and it does this by taking the surplus value from the working class, the profits that the workers make, takes it off them and invests it into making new means of production, developing the productive forces even further. And in that way, it creates a new market and it overcomes this temporary contradiction. But of course, this contradiction comes to the fore on a regular basis. And uh, of course, the, uh, the problem for the capitalist is once you invest more, once you create more means of production, more productive capacity, you create in the, you create in the means of produce even more an abundance of commodities all the time, increasingly. And therefore, the working class Again, it has to, uh, cannot, cannot absorb this, this amount being produced. So this ongoing contradiction of capitalism is there inherent in the system of overproduction. A mad term, really. A crazy idea. You know, we have the means to solve the problems of want in society, and yet we have the barrier of capitalism itself stopping us. They will not produce a house or food unless Profit is made out of it, and therefore is a barrier, as far as they're concerned, to the full development of the productive forces. There comes a time, however, when we, we're not faced simply with cyclical crisis, with this boom and slump, boom and slump, which in Marxist day was about every 10 years. Then, I think in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, it, it shrunk. It was about every five or six years. Now it's elongated back to about every ten years. The last one was, what, ten years ago. 2008. 
now uh, this this well I would say boom this not a boom this this attempted recovery has now exhausted itself and they are preparing the way for another downswing of the capitalist system on a world scale which is all in all likelihood will be on a bigger level than 2008 in other words another devastating crisis and although capitalism was able to prevent the slump of 2008 turning into a depression like in the 1930s it did this by lowering interest rates to uh, the lowest in history even negative incredible uh, situation and through yes quantitative easing now there's pumping money into the system liquidity into the system pumping money in there but of course is uh, now they've accumulated debts huge debts as a result because we are paying back for the austerity we're the ones who pay for it the only problem we've got now is um, what the hell are they going to do in the next downturn because they can't lower interest rates any further because they're negative they can't bail out the capitalist system anymore because they've exhausted quantitative easing and it doesn't work anyway they prove that in other words, they've used up all the weapons they had to prevent them sliding into a depression. There are other factors, we haven't got time to go into it. China also uh, pumped an, a massive amount of money into its economy. Biggest sort of uh, expansion in, Ch in China for, 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 for decades and decades. They can't do that again. So that's the problem that they faced. Our new crisis will be even more devastating than the previous one and one of the reasons for this severity is the fact that the capitalist system has reached its limits just like a slave society reached its limits and declined in fact it wasn't overthrown slave society it declined and disintegrated you had the rise of feudalism that also declined and was overthrown by the rising bourgeoisie at the time and now we, we have capitalism which also has exhausted itself and is in a state of terminal decline that's the reason why we have this disasters on a world scale this enormous uh, upheaval in society all this this this, this whole uh, uh, discontent and so on emerging from the crisis itself is because the terminal nature of the crisis does that mean to say that you know, one day, nine o'clock, Monday morning, it's all over? No, it doesn't mean that. This can go on for years and years and years. The depression in the 1930s lasted 10 years. The only reason why it stopped at 10 years is because they had a world war. It wasn't the New Deal in the United States that ended unemployment. It was the war. Of course, capitalism cannot have another world war because it would destroy the entire planet and the capitalists only go to war in order to win new territories gain new influence and make more profits a nuclear war would mean ashes so that's not that's not the way out for them but it shows that the all the crisis therefore is increasingly internalized it gets even worse and therefore you could have a depression going on they could slide into a press very easily and that would be a devastating crisis for for world capitalism but on the other hand it's going to provoke enormous backlash in society it is now at the present time we know that for a fact i think i had a quote here right, from 2009 it was quite quite a quite a funny quote really uh, this is a, an investor, a capitalist. He's looking at 2009. He says, uh, uh, I sense fear, anger, and a deep feeling of injustice reminiscent of the climate on the eve of a French Revolution. Just replace bread shortages with foreclosures, aristocrats with bankers, and the privileges such as the right not to pay tax with stock options, and you've got uh, the elements of a revolution and people are drawing revolutionary conclusions from this uh, this situation they're in deep down 
this can't go on. Is this the way out? What the hell's going on? And this is before the deep, real deep crisis of capitalism emerges. Of course, uh, capitalism will not collapse of its own accord. It has to be overthrown. But it creates conditions for its overthrow. That's the whole point. It creates such dis discontent in society, it prepares revolutionary movements. It is doing so now. Marx talked about the, the old mole of, of, of revolution, you know, burrowing away there as if they, no one notices it underneath the surface of, of the society, and then suddenly it emerges, unexpected. And that provokes a revolutionary crisis. And, and revolutions are unexpected largely. They, they don't expect them. And they emerge very quickly and rapidly out of whole contradictions coming together. I know that uh, mentioned the, the revolutionary movements in the 1920s and so on and so forth. We had others as well. I was, I was president in 1968 in France. Ten million workers seized the, the factories. It was the biggest general strike in history up until that time. Power was in the hands of the working class. Unfortunately, the leaders they had betrayed the movement. They, they sold it out. And that's what you've had periodically. Revolutions have taken place. You can point them out in different countries. Unfortunately, they've not been successful revolutions. The only successful one that took the workers to power was in 1917 in Russia, a hundred years ago. Well, well, the point is that the lessons from that is you need a correct leadership. That's the lesson. You know, what, the, what the, the Russians had, they had the Bolshevik party. Under Lenin and Trotsky, who were able to lead the advanced workers, again, a very small number of, of industrial workers, 3 million, led 150 million peasants to overthrow capitalism and landlordism. And if they could do it in a backward country like that, with all the difficulties that they had, then I think the task is probably a bit easier in, uh, in countries where there's a bigger proletariat. But it doesn't in any way negate the idea that you need a leadership. You need to create a revolutionary party in order to overthrow capitalism. Why? Because, well, the working class itself has uh, different layers. It draws dif different conclusions at different times. And the idea of the party a politi should be to draw those elements together, to give leadership to the working class, to overcome those differences, to link them together, to bind them together and offer a way forward. That's the, the idea of a revolutionary party. A bit like what Trotsky said in his great history of the Russian Revolution, where he compared it to the, the steam of the masses. It's like the energy of the masses. But the steam, if left alone, it will just dissipate into the air. But if steam is channeled through a piston box, it can drive a locomotive. It can be extremely powerful. That's what he was saying. And that's what the Revolutionary Party is. It's just a, a means of galvanizing the forces of the working class to end capitalism itself and not compromise with it. Because unfortunately, the Labour and Trade Union leaders we've had in Britain for a long time I've always to think the idea that you can patch up capitalism. You know, we can uh, make capitalism responsible. We can make it, you know, uh, sit over and purr, and they will get, uh, they'll get gains from it. Well, it doesn't work, unfortunately. This idea doesn't work. Capitalism cannot be reformed, particularly in it when it's in crisis, because that is counter-reforms, as we can see. And these counter-reforms, this austerity, it has nothing to do with the whims of a government. Some people say, oh, it's a political choice. It's not a political choice. Austerity is imposed upon a government. As I said, that's why it's international. Because of the, of the crisis of capitalism itself. That's the reason for it. And therefore, the only way you can get rid of it is getting rid of, of capitalism. It's not an individual thing. You can have nice people in a the government. They're doing nice things. They dictated to by the laws of capitalism. Just like uh, I was at the TUC the other week, and, the, and basically you have these people saying, well, there's good capitalists and bad capitalists. Good employers and bad empl employers. Well, I suppose they are in one sense, but in the other sense is capitalists take 
decisions according to their needs and the driving force of capitalism, not their own personal desires. Because uh, if they're in competition with other businesses, they'll be put out of business if they don't cut wages because someone else is cutting wages. It's not a question of you being nice. It's a question of the laws of capitalism itself, which you have to follow. If you're in the game, you have to do it. It's a rat race, actually. It's not a game. And that's what happens. So, you know, there's no way out on the basis of capitalism. You cannot reform capitalism. You cannot change it bit by bit overnight. And then suddenly you've got a, a socialist utopia. You have to do away with it because the resistance of the capitalists as well. No ruling class in history has ever given up its power and privileges without a struggle. Only thing is the working class is so strong, <laughs> potentially. And if this, is, this force is used, it can paralyze those, this minority of privileged, uh, this privileged class or the, the state that it might want to use against the movement. And they will threaten the movement. But the power of the working class is far stronger, far more powerful than what they've got to offer. But it needs a leadership that's prepared to go to the end, prepared to take that, that, uh, that decision, that way forward. Of course, you can't have socialism in one country. You have to appeal to workers in other countries. In Europe, we're facing austerity. In America, we're now turning towards socialism. Let's be clear about it. With the Bernie Sanders, it really uh, illustrated the ch big changes that are in the United States. It's an illustration of taking place everywhere, as a matter of fact. In other words, revolutionary developments are being prepared by capitalism, whether we like it or whether we don't like it. There's going to be revolutions, whether we are here or not here. The $64,000 question is, are they going to be successful or not? That's the main thing. And that's where we can play a role in helping to assist the revolution to become successful. And that's why we, are, we have to uh, realize as individuals, we can do a little bit. But if you're organized, you can do a lot more. Organization is key to the development of success of something. That is why we are um, not just a newspaper in social appeal, but an organization linked to the international Marxist tendency operating internationally. As I said, socialism is, cannot be established in one country. You have to fight internationally for the change in, in, the, in, the, in the world itself. Because on that basis, with the technology that is there, the resources that exist at the present time, we could transform the entire planet for the benefit of the peoples of the world. And it could be, yes, it could be a, a utopia in that sense, given the possibilities that is there. Does it 95% of scientists who ever lived in the whole of history are alive today? 95%. Thing is that most of them work for the military industrial complex. You can imagine if their talents were used for the benefit of society, how we could transform the globe, transform the lives of people. Imagine when we lower the, the hours of work. In other words, we don't see machinery or robotics as enemies but they'd be used to lower the burden of work, the hours we have to work. Not to, so we don't have to work 40 hours or 30. Why not work 20 or 10 hours to free up people to involve themselves in the running of society? We're talking about democracy. That's democracy. Not taking a, a, a ballot paper every five years for the involvement of, of the mass of people. But to do that, you have to give them time. Today, under capitalism, after working and sweating your whatever off, you want to go home and just turn the television on or go down the pub because you, you're up to you with it, with the stress of work and so on. But if you liberated people, the talent that you would liberate could be put to the productive benefit of society. You, you know, it's simple enough. But that cannot be done on the basis of capitalism. It can only be done on the basis of the overthrow of capitalism. And it becomes a real race against time in that sense. You can see how unstable society is at the moment. This uh, will, will mean, yes, movements will take place, opportunities will arise, but we have to take advantage of them. And that is why we have to organize ourselves. Yes, we fight within the trade unions. We fight within the working class. We fight also within the Labour Party. The Labour Party in Britain is the mass organization of the working class. It needs to be transformed and retransformed. 
And that way, yes, we support uh, Corbyn, we support the fight against the right wing, but we want to go much further. We want to actually change society, not patch it up. Because a patched up capitalism is no good for anybody. Not good for the capitalists, and it won't be good for us. It has to be a clean sweep. But in that way, people will respond to it. People are cheesed off. People are not happy. People are fed up. And deep down, they believe, surely there is a better world that we could create for our children and their children. And it is. But it has to be fought for and it has to be explained. That is why we believe that uh, what Marx explained, you know, philosophers have uh, explained the world. The point, however, is to change it. And that's what Marxism uh, uh, poses the question. Not just to understand, that's the first thing, but then to act. Because when you act, then we can change with the working class. We can change society and introduce a whole new world order for our people, the working people of this world. It's within our grasp, it's within our generation. Capitalism is now crying out for change. The ruling class are holding on, like, uh, like declining on to their power. But they are like uh, uh, a dead man walking in one sense. It's up to us now to ensure we put them where they should be, in the grave. <laughs> Bury capitalism and build a new society fit for humanity. That's what we have to do. So join us, join Socialist Appeal, join the IMT. Help us create this organization that can help to change society in Britain and internationally. It's fight, it's fight for our future. No one else is going to do it but ourselves. Please join us. Please, let's fight. Let's win. Thank you very much.